My name is Michael Skinneter, and I'm an MD-PhD student from the University of British Columbia in Vancouver, Canada. I'm sorry that because of my clinical obligations, I couldn't be there with you in Vienna today, but I'm very honored to have received the International Burn Seal Award, and I'm very grateful for this opportunity to tell you about some of my work over the last few years on machine learning for biological mass spectrometry. Today I'd like to tell you two different stories about how I've applied machine learning to large-scale biological datasets generated using mass spectrometry to help understand and diagnose human disease. I'll tell you first about using proteomics to understand the molecular basis of inherited disease, and then about using metabolomics to diagnose acute drug intoxication. I've spent the last eight years in Vancouver earning my MD PhD with Leonard Foster, an internationally recognized expert in using mass spectrometry to measure proteins. And this of course is a technique known as proteomics. In my PhD thesis, I used proteomics to tackle an interesting puzzle in genetic disease, which is that inherited mutations which are present in virtually every cell in the body, often cause dysfunction in just a single tissue. For example, in Huntington's disease, the mutated Huntington protein is actually expressed at high levels in the heart, liver, and lungs, in addition to the brain. But we think of Huntington's disease as a neurodegenerative syndrome, not a cardiovascular disease. So why is that? One hypothesis might be that the Huntington mutation is affecting a brain-specific protein-protein interaction, and perturbing that interaction is what ultimately leads to neurodegeneration. The challenge is that to test this kind of hypothesis, you would need a method to systematically map protein-protein interactions in the brain, and this had never been done before. The most widely used methods to map protein interaction networks take place in genetically modified cell lines, or in heterologous expression systems in yeast. As an assistant professor, Leonard had pioneered a new proteomic approach to map networks of protein-protein interactions called cofractionation mass spectrometry. The idea behind cofractionation was that you could take any arbitrary biological sample and use chromatography to separate the protein complexes within that sample according to their size into a series of fractions. You could then use quantitative proteomics to measure protein abundance in each of those fractions, and this would give you an elution curve for each protein, where each peak in this elution curve represents a stable protein complex. If a pair of proteins didn't interact with one another, then they would have dissimilar elution curves. But a pair of interacting proteins would have tightly correlated elution curves. And so the idea was that by measuring every protein's elution curve at once, you could simultaneously identify every pair of interacting proteins in the sample with a single experiment. One very appealing property of cofractionation is that it can be applied to essentially any sample. Unlike these more conventional methods that take place in genetically modified cell lines or in yeast cells, Cofractionation can work under physiological conditions, even in complex tissues. And so the main goal of my PhD thesis was to use cofractionation mass spectrometry to map the protein interaction networks in living mammalian tissues for the first time. The actual cofractionation experiments were done by Nick Scott, a postdoc in Leonard's lab, in what was a pretty heroic experimental effort and Nick collected high-quality elution curves for thousands of proteins across seven mouse tissues. The computational challenge in this data, though, is picking out the tiny minority of interacting protein pairs in these huge proteomic datasets. If we had measured just 100 proteins in each tissue, we would have had to decide whether or not our data supported an interaction for about 5,000 pairs of proteins. But we had measured upwards of 5,000 proteins in each tissue, and that meant that for each tissue, 
we had to decide whether or not 13 million different pairs of proteins were interacting. And so to actually learn anything about biology from this data set, I first had to overcome this challenge and figure out how to identify interacting proteins in cofractionation data. Now, I wasn't the first person to ever try to tackle this problem. Other people had collected cofractionation data before Nick, and they'd had to find a solution to this problem too. But I realized that in the literature, there was surprisingly little agreement on the best way to identify interacting protein pairs in cofractionation data. At the most basic level, people couldn't even agree on the best way to score how similar two protein elution curves were. I really wanted to solve this problem once and for all, and I decided that the only way to do this would be to reanalyze every cofractionation experiment that had ever been published. I downloaded more than 12,000 mass spectrometry files from 206 cofractionation studies, and collectively had taken more than 27 months of uninterrupted mass spectrometry time to acquire. I then reanalyzed all of these experiments with the same computational pipeline, and I ended up with a data set of more than 11 million measurements of protein abundance. When we submitted this data set to PRIDE, which is the main repository for proteomics data, they told us that they were pretty sure it was the largest proteomic data set in existence. I used this enormous data set to figure out the optimal way to analyze cofractionation data. Using known protein interactions as a ground truth, I benchmarked every individual step of the computational analysis pipeline. And I created a package that implemented what I found to be the globally optimal approach to identifying protein interactions by machine learning on cofractionation data. I then used this package to integrate every human cofractionation experiment that had ever been published and assemble a draft map of the human protein interaction network by cofractionation mass spectrometry. Remarkably, I showed that integrating cofractionation data at this scale allowed us to map protein interactions even more accurately than these conventional assays in genetically modified cell lines or yeast, which are orders of magnitude more labor intensive. And I then applied this optimized approach to map protein interaction networks for every species or phylogenetic clade in the entire data set, providing a resource to understand the evolution of protein interaction networks throughout the tree of life. Now with the right computational tools in hand, I could go back to our tissue data set and pick out the tiny minority of interacting proteins from among the millions of possible pairs in each tissue. Unfortunately, I don't have time to talk about everything that we learned from this data set, but I will highlight what we learned about genetic disease. First, we found that genes associated with human disease tended to be disproportionately rewired across tissues. That is, they showed significantly more variation in which proteins they interacted with from one tissue to another. And this is consistent with the idea that disease genes are involved in tissue-specific interactions that might mediate some of their tissue-specific effects. And when we looked at genes associated with the same tissue-specific genetic disease, for example, congenital heart disease, we found that those genes did tend to physically interact with one another, but only in the specific tissue where mutations cause symptoms. So this is really the first experimental support for the idea that tissue-specific genetic diseases involve rewiring of tissue-specific protein interactions. To highlight just one example of this, we discovered a heart-specific form of the ribosome formed by incorporation of the protein RPL3L, a protein that exome sequencing studies had associated with atrial fibrillation, which of course is a disease of the heart. I think that this line of work provides a great example of how big biological data sets can be used to understand the pathogenesis of human disease. But I next wanted to go beyond this and use mass spectrometry data to actually diagnose disease. And so next I'd like to tell you 
about how this led me to diagnose acute drug intoxication using metabolomics. In the work that I just told you about, we took it for granted that we'd be able to identify the proteins that we measured with mass spectrometry. But identifying small molecules that are measured with mass spectrometry is still a very challenging and unsolved problem. I felt that there was an opportunity to use artificial intelligence to solve this problem. And to do this, I teamed up with David Wishart at the University of Alberta to start developing chemical AI for metabolomics data. Our idea was to take AI tools that had been developed for human language and apply these tools to textual representations of chemical structures using a format called SMILES, which has been around since the 1980s. These AI tools for human language have been in the news lately with headlines talking about how they've mastered human language and even questions about whether they've become sentient. But for all this hype, the core concept behind how these models work is surprisingly simple. The basic premise of a language model is to learn to predict what the next word in a sentence is going to be based on the ones that have come before. For example, a good language model should learn that a sentence that starts with the words, the clouds are in the, is relatively likely to end with a word like sky or perhaps air, and much less likely to end with a word like school or popcorn. We thought that instead of training a neural network to predict the next word in a sentence, we could train the exact same model to predict the next character in a smile string. And we could then sample from the trained model to generate new molecules, one character at a time. However, very early on in this work, we realized that we had a problem. Most studies that had worked with these kinds of models had trained them on hundreds of thousands or even millions of molecules. And that had worked really well. But there just aren't millions of known human metabolites. There are maybe tens of thousands. And when we tried to train a model on tens of thousands of molecules, we found that our model could barely even learn the SMILES format. And so to actually apply these models to mass spectrometry-based metabolomics data, we first had to figure out if they could even be learned from such small data sets. The solution that we found is a new twist on an old idea called data augmentation. And the basic concept of data augmentation is to create many slightly different copies of the input data. For example, if you want to train a neural network on photos of cats, the idea is you can crop and rotate and mirror those photos. At the end of the day, it's still the same cat. And the analogy to chemistry is that there are actually many different ways to represent the same molecule using SMILE. By convention, each molecule has a single canonical SMILE's representation, but there's actually no reason that you can't generate dozens or even hundreds of non-canonical SMILE's that all represent the exact same chemical structure. We found that when we started making many non-canonical smiles for the same molecule, we could essentially trick the neural network into thinking that it was learning from a much larger training data set. All of a sudden, a neural network trained on just a thousand molecules was almost as good as the one trained on a hundred thousand molecules. And this wasn't just a theoretical advance, but it was actually the key insight that allowed us to start using these models to identify new molecules in mass spectrometry data. In a proof of concept study that we published last year, in collaboration with Peter Dalsgaard from the University of Copenhagen, we showed that our chemical AI could automatically identify one kind of unknown molecule in mass spectrometry data, specifically new designer drugs of abuse. So what are designer drugs? Typically, they're slightly modified versions of existing illicit drugs that retain the psychoactive properties of those drugs while avoiding laws on drug control. Some of the best known examples of designer drugs include synthetic cannabinoids, synthetic fentanyl derivatives, and synthetic cathinones, also known as bath salts. The lack of laws controlling these drugs mean that they're constantly appearing on and then disappearing from the illicit market. 
and there are literally hundreds of new designer drugs detected every year. But actually identifying these molecules in biological samples, like blood, can be very challenging and labor intensive. And so we asked if we could use generative AI to accelerate this process. We trained a chemical language model on the smile strings of about 1,700 known designer drugs, and then we started sampling new chemical structures from this trained model. And we found that using this non-canonical smiles trick, we were able to train a model that could generate new molecules from the exact same areas of chemical space as known designer drugs. In these panels, each point is a chemical structure and the X and Y axes show a low dimensional representation of chemical space. You can see that there's almost a perfect overlap between the generated molecules and the known designer drugs in these plots. And that suggests that our model has learned to generate molecules that are similar to known designer drugs. But as a more quantitative test of our model, we asked if it could correctly anticipate the designer drugs that emerged on the illicit market in the six months after our model was trained. Amazingly, we found that our model was able to correctly anticipate more than 90% of these emerging designer drugs. Now, one thing that you end up doing when you're writing a new machine learning model is you spend a lot of time looking through random outputs from the model. And as I looked through the model's outputs, I started to notice the same molecules being generated over and over. To quantify this more systematically, I sampled a billion molecules from the trained model. And I found that while most molecules were only generated once or twice, a small minority of molecules were being generated tens or even hundreds of thousands of times. And when I started to look at the chemical structures of these molecules, I noticed that the single most frequently sampled molecule was actually a new synthetic cannabinoid that had been discovered by forensic labs less than a month after we finalized our training data. More systematically, I found that molecules that were generated more frequently tended to be more structurally similar to a known designer drug. And so these observations led to a crazy idea. Could our AI be learning to statistically anticipate what designer drugs are going to emerge on the illicit market next? We tested this idea on a new designer drug that the Danish National Forensic Lab had just discovered, a new derivative of the street drug PCP called deoxymethoxetamine. And we asked, if all we knew about this compound was its exact mass, would our model have guessed the right structure? Sure enough, out of about 18,000 generated molecules that matched this exact mass, the single most frequently sampled molecule was deoxymethoxetamine itself. So we called this statistical function that our model had learned over unseen designer drugs the structural prior. And we found that when we combined the structural prior with mass spectrometry data, we could do de novo structure elucidation of new designer drugs with unprecedented accuracy. On a set of 79 designer drugs that were discovered after we finalized our model, we could get the structure exactly right for 51% of these, compared to just 1% with mass spectrometry alone. And we could also get the correct structure in the top 10, almost 90% of the time. So another way to think about this is nine times out of 10, the correct answer is somewhere inside our model's short list of 10 compounds. And we noticed that even when our model failed, it tended to predict something very close to the truth. For example, for this designer analog of MDMA or ecstasy, our model got the core structure right and just misplaced a methyl group. This work got a lot of attention in the media, which in turn led to collaborations with forensic labs and law enforcement agencies. One collaboration that was particularly exciting was being approached by a major US law enforcement agency in the middle of a mass casualty event who asked if we could help them identify a causative designer drug. I think there are a lot of opportunities in the future to develop this technology further and open up the possibility of comprehensively identifying every known and unknown molecule in any biological sample. So this is a line of work that I'm committed to pursuing in the future, hopefully in my own lab. And I'm very grateful for the support and the recognition of the International Bernstein Award in pursuing this goal.
Of course, I'd like to also thank all the people who have contributed to this work over the years in the Foster, Wishart, and Dalsgaard lab, as well as the funding agencies that supported it. So, thank you again. Thank you.